be less salt in the dense phase than in the dilute phase was borne out by these data. But as again, as I said, hold that thought. It's impossible to fit our data to the Voron Overbeek theory. If you look at the one with the very high, the theoretical curve with the very high uh, critical point on the upper left, uh, the parameters for the Voron Overbeek theory are pretty well knowable a priori. So that top curve is what would be predicted by the Voron Overbeek theory. If you arbitrarily adjust it downward, then what you miss is the high uh, constant polymer concentration part of the phase diagram. So clearly, something is going on, and it is probably the uh, proper uh, 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 treatment of correlations in the dense polymer phase. Um, this has been attracting theoretical attention by very competent and serious people, Glenn Fredrickson, Zhen Gong Wang, Charles Singh, uh, Muta Kumar. And uh, Zhen Gong, in a paper a couple of years ago, compared uh, the Voron Overbeek theory on the lower right with a simple modification that takes into account some of the correlations uh, that one might expect in terms of excluded volume and, and so on, and made a prediction that looks a lot more like our data. There still haven't been very detailed uh, uh, comparisons between theory and experiment, but I believe those are coming. And that's the point of taking the time to produce a really full and precise phase diagram. I should have pointed out, and you can see it on this plot, uh, there are error bars, both horizontal and vertical there. Lou Lee measured the polymer and salt concentration 10 times for each of those data points. And in some cases, the error bars are smaller than the size of the data points that we've used. So I think it's worthy of theoretical uh, attention. Um, <clears throat> what drives this? It might, like I said, might be kind of obvious that if you have two oppositely charged polymers, they're going to make a complex. But if you study the thermodynamics of this, um, as uh, we did with isothermal titration calorimetry, and extract an enthalpic term, which is related to the electrostatic interaction, and an entropic term, you see that the contributions to the overall free energy change from enthalpy are, uh, sorry, are a lot, from enthalpy are a lot smaller than those from entropy. And where does entropy come from? One uh, obvious place is that if two uh, macro uh, charged uh, ions can neutralize one another, they're already entropically challenged themselves, they can liberate a lot of small counter ions. And that produces some disorder in the system uh, that leads to the entropy increase. Um, but there are other things, too, and Zhen Gang Wang is, is focusing on some of these that have to do with hydration and the change in dielectric constant in the water. So stay tuned for a more precise uh, comparison. Um, another variable we thought we could study with this was um, varying the degree of charge in the polymer. And for that, again, we wanted to be in the same situation of having the same polymer background bone exactly, and uh, just having positive or negative charges. And so uh, Angelica Neitzel synthesized a bunch of random copolymers of polyethylene oxide and polyallyl glycidyl ether, uh, which puts a pendant allyl group on there. And as you can see, she made a, a set of five of them varying from 10% uh, allyl glycidyl ether to 100%. And then uh, one can use different, oh, sorry, I didn't, didn't, I must have left a slide out. One can use that pendant allyl group to attach either a positive or a negatively charged uh, group. It could either be uh, on the negative side, uh, sulfonate, or on the positive side, ammonium or uh, uh, guanidinium. And these things produce liquid-liquid uh, phase separation too. Although if you go to the most lowly charged thing, and this is salt concentration moving to the right in each of these, uh, the 30% charged is easily disrupted at 100 millimolar salt. So uh, the driving force for liquid, liquid phase separation isn't nearly as strong. Uh, 
They produce phase diagrams where the, fa the two-phase boundary is a lot smaller with 30% charge. Most interesting to us was the fact that it's, it's uh, 30, um, uh, 30, uh, 54, 72, and 100. Actually, the slope of the tie lines uh, as you go from fully charged to weakly charged changes from negative to positive. So this idea that I had that these tie lines should always be negatively sloped is not true. So that's uh, something to bear in mind. Um, we also used the same system to start to test some th ideas that relate to correlations that one might find in, in polyelectrolyte solutions. Uh, there's uh, an old prediction of Michael Rubinstein there in equation one that says that the polymer concentration on the dense side of the phase diagram at zero salt should vary like the two-thirds power of the fractional charge. And so we had, you know, four different polymers and, and we tested that, the weight fraction of polymer in, in figure A on the vertical axis and the fractional charge on the right. You can see that at high charge, oh, by the way, that, that prediction of equation one is only valid for low degrees of charge. So, um, the 100% charge, the 72% and the 54% don't really fall in that range, although that behavior on the right-hand side can be captured in simulations, which also then predict a changeover to a uh, two-thirds slope at lower charge density. The 30% certainly doesn't fall on that line. I mean, we can't tell if it falls on that line, is what I mean to say. It, it certainly doesn't fall on the high uh, charge fraction line. So we're currently making higher molecular weight polymers uh, so that we can get to lower charge density and test some of these theoretical scaling laws, which are one attempt to assess the role of correlations in this electrostatically driven liquid-liquid phase separation. Uh, but we've also recently um, employed another method which tries to get at, again, a scaling uh, picture of what uh, semi-dilute uh, polymer solutions look like. And the scaling picture, which has been played out over the last couple of decades, has been that a polyanion, polycation mixture would form blobs like polymers and semi-dilute solutions would, but there'd be correlations among the positioning of the blobs, such that the positively charged blobs would like to be surrounded by negative and, and vice versa, and so you might get a kind of uh, ordered, uh, or at least an, a, an arrangement with some order, such that the uh, radial distribution function would have oscillations in it. And uh, I don't know why this thing jumps ahead so much. So um, the, th the idea was to measure the, the total uh, scattering function, G total, and then uh, measure the, uh, let's say, the anion, anion correlation function. And the difference between those two should be uh, the charge uh, group correlation function. And there's a prediction for that that is different from the standard ornstein zernike which is the equation on the upper right-hand side that uh, says that if you go to very high salt concentration, you sort of go back to an ornstein zernike like thing. And uh, so you don't see anything if all of the polymers have the same scattering contrast. But what we did using the same chemistry that I showed you is um, make um, con new, uh, polymers that have neutron scattering contrast by, in, in this particular case, using deuterated uh, polymers that put a uh, positively charged ammonium deuterated on the, um, uh, the 30% uh, polymer and then mixing it with a 30% sulfonated polymer. And to make a long story short, one can look at the three kinds of scattering curves 
and by subtracting the one from the other, that is the total scattering from the uh, anion scattering, you start to get a correlation peak, which is indicative that there is some kind of correlation uh, in the positions of the positively charged, and presumably there would be of the negatively charged. So there's more to it than just blobs. There is an arrangement that we believe is visualized here in the neutron scattering that picks out a certain correlation length uh, between the positively charged blobs. Anyway, um, I'm gonna skip over this. You can wipe that out with uh, uh, addition of salt. Um, so we think this is um, one of the first times that one has observed scattering from only the polyanions in a polyanion polycation mixture by deuterium labeling. And as expected in the middle curve there, that peak in the lowest curve in the middle goes away when you add salt. Okay. Uh, I'm going to move now from some basic physics of polyelectrolyte solutions to using these electrostatic interactions to make new materials and uh, to uh, pursue self-assembly by making block copolymers. So what I've illustrated here are block copolymers, dye blocks and tri blocks, where one has a neutral block, which in our case will mostly be polyethylene oxide, and a positively or a negatively charged block where we uh, can use the same chemistry that I've already introduced, polyallyl glycidyl ether, to turn the same polymer into either a polyanion block or a polycation block. Um, uh, I'm gonna, I skipped over a slide, but this time I'm going to let it go. Um, if you do that, what I said, you can make uh, sulfonated and guanidinylated uh, versions of exactly the same backbone and um, uh, molecular weight and so on. And Sam Srivastava, who's here uh, working with me, uh, built on some earlier work of Dan Krogstad at Santa Barbara to show that as you build up the concentration of these uh, micelles formed uh, by the complexation of the polyanion, polycation blocks to form these cores that you see, you move from a disordered assembly to an ordered cubic assembly to hexagonal and then further to uh, planar assemblies. And, <coughs> and uh, that enabled Sam to really map out uh, something that might be the block copolymer phase diagram for ordered uh, block copolyelectrolytes. It's a little bit different. You can see that the uh, spherical phase uh, pinches off when the charged end block fraction gets too big and you go into a regime where uh, you have both uh, either cylindrical or lamellar phases as you increase uh, polymer concentration. So that's one thing that one can do with the self-assembly of this type. But um, we've also been looking at these things as uh, delivery vehicles um, for nucleic acids, <clears throat> where the nucleic acid is the uh, negatively charged polyelectrolyte. This has been used in, in practice already. Uh, the complexation and with, let's say, a PEG polylysine block copolymer forms a micelle with the negatively charged nucleic acid in the core. And this can provide uh, protection against uh, nuclease attack. It's, it's quite versatile. One can use it for different sizes and different types of nucleic acids. Um, you can um, functionalize the outside end of the peg to make it a targeted delivery vehicle. And uh, Potential application areas include um, uh, a variety of cancer applications and a variety of cardiovascular uh, applications as well. Um, <coughs> sorry. Um, Michael Lukaida and Jeff Vierig and others, Lorraine Leon, who's here, have studied 
these kind of micelles. And what we've found is if you have um, single-stranded uh, nucleic acids and you complex them with uh, a PEG uh, polylysine and do the X-ray scattering or cryo-TEM, you get spherical micelles of reasonably uniform size. The spherical micelle is indicated by the flat scattering at low Q. One can extract a radius of about 16 nanometers that agrees very well with the mean radius that you see also in uh, cryo-TEM. And uh, these things are not very polydisperse. So under uh, many conditions, one can quickly and uniformly make uh, uh, uniform uh, spherical micelles. Sometimes some annealing is required uh, in order to uh, make these things as reproducible as one would like, but they're not too difficult to make, and the spherical geometry is, um, is very uh, well established. Um, Alex Morris uh, has looked into this a little more carefully and tried to look at um, how the sizes of the resulting micelles <clears throat> on the upper right depend upon the sizes of the A and B blocks in the block copolymer, as well as the C block of the homopolymer that one is making. And he used both uh, DNA, single-stranded DNA, and polyglutamic acid as his polyanions. And so uh, small angle X-ray scattering uh, was uh, used to determine the core radius and dynamic light scattering was used to determine the exterior hydrodynamic radius. <clears throat> and um, the net result of, of what Alex found that was published uh, uh, almost a year ago now is that the size of the micelle is overwhelmingly dependent uh, the, that is the core radius, which is what I'm calling the size of the micelle, is overwhelmingly dependent on the size of the polylysine block, the cationic block in the PEG polycation uh, block copolymer. Thanks, Norma. Um, and not very dependent at all on the size of the other two blocks. <clears throat> So it is essentially not dependent at all on the size of the homopolymer and weakly dependent on the size of the peg in, in the corona, uh, which is a useful kind of design parameter, uh, I think, for uh, designing a carrier vehicle for some of these applications that I'm going to talk about. So um, where we have been trying to apply this uh, very specifically is in uh, cardiovascular disease. This diagram is, shouldn't be taken as a snapshot, but as a time series from left to right of how an atherosclerotic plaque develops. It starts with some kind of inflammation, either lipid penetration into the blood vessel lining, which is what's illustrated here, or something external like a disturbed blood flow or vortex motion. And that upregulates uh, functional molecules in the endothelium, such as vascular cell adhesion molecule, that recruit monocytes to come in and try to reduce the inflammation. Uh, if it's lipid, they turn into macrophages and try to sequester and transport out the lipid. But eventually, that in many cases is not fully successful and you end up with an accumulation of dead cells and lipid that turn into an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, we uh, have been thinking about this ever since uh, late uh, in my time in, in Santa Barbara, but um, uh, about uh, six years ago, uh, we looked at using micelles like I told you about just now to deliver a therapeutic nucleic acid to uh, endothelial cells. And in these experiments, uh, we simply uh, did cell culture. But um, again, some of my coworkers who are here 
uh, Lorraine and Unji uh, in particular, uh, participated in these experiments. There is a micro RNA, a small RNA in the endothelial lining that contributes to inflammation. And so one way of dialing back the inflammation in this cascade that I was talking about is to deliver an inhibitor of that micro RNA. And in fact, such an inhibitor is commercially available. It's sold by Dharmacon, and it's essentially a uh, complement to the micro RNA. It binds uh, to the, the micro RNA uh, in the uh, regular base pairing fashion. And so what we've done is design a delivery vehicle of the sort that I told you about, a PEG polylysine block copolymer that complexes with this known microRNA inhibitor. But in addition, we put on the outside a short VCAM uh, receptor that is a short uh, peptide that binds to vascular cell adhesion molecule, VCAM on the left-hand side of this diagram to carry these micelles with the therapeutic nucleic acid directly to the site of inflammation. Um, so this is the kind of vehicle uh, that we used in, in the paper that I cited there in cell culture, but uh, I'm now about to show you some experiments uh, in mice. So as I said, these things form uniform spherical micelles. You have this negatively charged microRNA inhibitor we have a block copolymer that's PEG polylysine, but with a VCAM targeting peptide on the exterior. And you know, this is uh, one of the, just looking ahead, I'm not gonna show you any data like this, but this is one of the important features of using uh, self-assembly as a way of making uh, biofunctional nanoparticles. There's really no reason why we couldn't put more than one kind of functional peptide on the outside and make a micelle that had two or three functionalities, one for targeting, maybe one for cell penetration, and other things like that. So I want to call attention to the merits of self-assembled nanoparticles uh, for these kind of applications as well. Um, so um, here's uh, the kind of results that you get uh, when you do these experiments on uh, mice. Uh, first of all, mice don't get atherosclerosis. Um, you know, it's atherosclerosis in larger mammals is a slow developing disease. Uh, mice only live two years. They eat a pretty healthy diet. Um, but uh, Jackson Lab in Maine sells what are called APOE knockout mice. And these mice don't produce what we sometimes call good cholesterol. Uh, these uh, lipoproteins that help re re remove uh, cholesterol from the bloodstream. And these mice um, uh, get atherosclerosis within a few months um, after being fed what's called a high fat diet. That's what HFD stands for, or sometimes called a Western diet, um, seriously. Um, so this is the result of some experiments where we condition such a mouse uh, for 16 weeks. After eight weeks, we made one injection of eight milligrams per kilogram of body weight. And then we sacrificed the animal and looked at the size of the atherosclerotic lesions that developed. In the first column, we injected phosphate buffered saline. So that's a control and it kind of sets the baseline. So if you take the average of those blue diamonds, uh, that's what we consider to be one. You can actually get pretty good results by injecting this uh, micro RNA inhibitor all by itself without our package. And that produces a 55% reduction at this level in the average size of the atherosclerotic lesions. The uh, third column is another uh, control where we scramble the, uh, the inhibitor, the, the uh, oligonucleotide. So it's not really an inhibitor, but we have a package that has all the same elements, just a different a different nucleic acid, and you get nothing on average there. But if you deliver it in a targeted form, uh, we get an 80% reduction in the size of the atherosclerotic lesions. Um, and if you reduce the dose by half, 
Now, the naked inhibitor doesn't produce any statistically significant reduction, but our targeted delivery vehicle produces a 70% reduction. So we believe that this is an effective, uh, potent uh, way to deliver um, uh, a therapeutic nucleic acid to sites of uh, vascular inflammation, which in this case lead to atherosclerosis. But there are other examples of uh, uh, modifications or things that one might do in a blood vessel. In this case, the model experiment is that if you look toward the image in the upper left, we do what's called a partial carotid ligation. We narrow the blood vessel by putting a surgical constriction in it. And then we do the same kind of protocol. It's a little different. We do more injections, but that doesn't pertain to what I really want to get across. Exactly the same uh, polyelectrolyte complex micelle delivery vehicle. And then we look at how big a, a, a plaque is produced downstream from the ligation. And you can see with PBS or even with the naked inhibitor or with the scrambled inhibitor, we get statistically the same kind of uh, occlusion of the blood vessel, but delivering this uh, package in this way reduces the size of the downstream plaque by about 85%. Um, I, I, I'm gonna say one more thing about this. We've also tested this in an operation that is done on kidney dialysis patients that's called an arteriovenous fistula to get good vascular access for patients that are undergoing kidney dialysis. And I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. I wasn't until we started to think about this. But about 50% of those arteriovenous fistulas fail in a way like this uh, downstream of where the surgery is done because of the disturbed blood flow that's, that's created by this ligation or by the fistula, and we can keep those fistulas open as well too. So we're on the verge of trying uh, some clinical trials on larger animals. And I think you know something like uh, arteriovenous fistula, while it's not as big a potential clinical uh, indication as atherosclerosis, is probably a better place to start with actually trying some of these things on humans because with atherosclerosis, you don't really know who has it. It's, it's hard to conceive of the right kind of protocol for doing to humans what we did with those mice. And I'm not talking about you know, the sacrificing part. I'm talking about the, uh, the treatment part. When would you give, when would you administer something like this? And it, it's hard to answer that question. But with somebody who's having an, uh, an arteriovenous fistula, or a stent implanted in a coronary artery, you know that person might suffer this kind of complications for which this vehicle can uh, possibly be useful. Okay, I wanted to finish up by going back to the statement I made before about origin of life. I guess I didn't put a date on this, and this, but it's, uh, it's not too old a paper in Nature Communications, and you can find literally dozens of papers like this that assert that um, coacervate droplets, as it says here, are the missing link between chemistry and biology in the origins of life. Um, this is an idea that's decades old, um, and the idea is, of course, that we, before we had lipids, uh, we had possibly simpler molecules, such as proteins, um, that were some of the first molecules formed according to some other kinds of origin of life experiments that could have produced uh, polyelectrolyte complexation and therefore some compartmentalization. As it says here, according to the abiogenesis scenario, a coacervate droplet is formed from organic molecules via liquid-liquid phase separation and results mainly from the spontaneous assembly and in particular prebiotic polymers or uh, oligomers. Well, um, this is really nothing more than speculation. A few years ago, my colleague, now colleague, he, he was um, at Harvard at the time, uh, Jack Sostak, examined polyelectrolyte uh, coacervate droplets and looked at 
dye-labeled RNA exchange between droplets. And if you read, I, I, I don't know why I didn't highlight the whole thing, but, but uh, there is compartmentalization, as, as you would expect, but in the fourth line from the bottom, Jack determined that there's a high rate of RNA exchange uh, between the droplets, and so therefore they were unlikely to be stable and permanent enough to actually uh, serve as stable compartments and prebiotic cells. And th the jury's still out on all of this, but we've made an interesting observation recently that I think bears on this. If you, and this was done in collaboration with uh, Alamgir Karim uh, and his group at the University of Houston. It was just accepted last week in the, the PNAS. Um, we did what I told you. We took the two polyelectrolyte solutions, put them together, and formed coacervate droplets in supernatant, which over time coalesce and macroscopically phase separate. But if you change the supernatant into distilled water and shake the thing up so as to redisperse uh, the macroscopic uh, phase separated material into droplets, they don't coalesce anymore. Here's, I'll, I'll go back to the previous slide, but uh, if you make some droplets like that with uh, red dye and some with green dye, and you leave them in the salt containing supernatant like at the upper left, well then some of the red dye gets into the green uh, droplets and some of the green dye gets into the red droplets, uh, indicating the kind of exchange that Jack was referring to. But on the right-hand side, if you put them in distilled water, uh, there isn't any exchange. So we believe there's a kind of a skin forming resulting from, uh, let's call it an ejection or a kind of um, uh, leaching of uh, counter ions that produce a kind of ionic cross-linking on the surface of these droplets and gives them a physically um, tougher uh, exterior that does not allow them to coalesce anymore. Uh, and if you do FRAP experiments, for example, uh, you can see that the interior of each is still liquid. We're not turning them into solid balls uh, that uh, are, are uh, you know, totally different, but they have a skin on them and the, the recovery rate in a, in a FRAP experiment is about the same, uh, a little bit slower when, when you've uh, kind of uh, toughened the skin with, with distilled water. So um, we think that, um, that this might play a role. I mean, you might ask yourself, where did distilled water uh, come from in prebiotic life, and I, I, I had my own idea about this, but I posed it to Jack Sostak, and he immediately said the answer that I hoped he would say, which is rain. Um, but um, by all means, what we've done here now doesn't prove that uh, coacervate droplets are related to the origins of life. It just shows that maybe there are things that could have manipulated the rate of exchange, and then in a more utilitarian sense, one could think about using this to manipulate the, the rate of exchange uh, between coacervate droplets. And it, it also calls into question, um, you know, if these coacervate droplets uh, coalesce, how is it, what, what is it that is actually making membraneless organelles stable? Why don't they uh, coalesce and merge with one another? And I, I don't have the answer to that. I think that our picture of um, a skin forming and ionic complexation might not be the whole story. There was another um, interesting paper uh, published um, the lower right here um, that argued that uh, the zeta potential of droplets is important in their stabilization. So it could be, rather than the physical toughness of the droplet, it could be related to the charge on, on the surface of the droplets. But there's some interesting stuff going on here. Uh, it's certainly an interesting phenomena in the intracellular organelles. Uh, whether any of this relates to origin of life, I think is gonna take uh, another decade or two to figure out. So uh, what I've tried to 
convey is that polyelectrolyte complexation makes a wide variety of interesting materials. Bulk complexes, complex core micelles, cross-linked hydrogels, and we, along with many uh, of my colleagues here in the audience, ha have worked on this over the last decade. And uh, I think there's still uh, life in this um, to pursue both uh, new physics and new materials and, and potentially new biology. So um, I wanted to specifically call out people who've done some of the most recent parts of this. Angelica Neitzel, uh, working with a graduate student, Jan Fang, have done some of the things on correlations and on uh, effects of charge. Alice, Alex uh, Morris led the most recent uh, micelle work, building on what Michael Lukaida and Jeff um, Virig have done, and Zhengji Zhao is really leading our work in collaboration with Yun Feng on uh, biomedicine uh, applications. But uh, I'm just putting into bold my coworkers who are here who contributed mightily as well over the last decade to many of the things that I've talked about. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. for some questions. I can't see a thing, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was crystal, crystal clear, huh? Yeah. Thanks for this excellent talk. I was just wondering when you are delivering microRNA through these capsules, what kind of delivery mode? I mean, I thinking of systemic or localized because I think... No, no, it, it's delivered through the tail vein, so it's, it's systemic. And, uh, you know, it goes everywhere. The circulation in the mouse is pretty quick. So is uh, it not... Have, having said that, if we really do start to apply this, for example, to kidney dialysis experiments, you have access to their vasculature uh, three times a week or more, so they might be delivered a little bit more locally in some applications. Right, and the second point was you showed that there is a dynamic exchange, this ejection or leaching. So how long are the capsules stable before they reach the site of interest? Yeah, um, I don't have a, a definite answer for that, um, but it doesn't really take very long uh, for these things to reach their targets. And I think the avidity of uh, landing on the target really means that a lot of it gets there, let's put it that way. Um, I don't know how much might be lost uh, before getting there, but I also think that the results that we get by injecting the naked inhibitor is kind of a good control. You know, it, if, we, if everything was lost, we, we would get something like the same effect that we get with the naked inhibitor, and we get a better effect than that. Okay, all right, thanks. Hey, Matt. Um, so I, on the, I guess the same line of questioning, you, you mentioned using these, um, that treatment for AV fistula um, treatment, right? Uh -huh. um, I guess I had two points. One, in terms of, you mentioned that it's a good, a good way to look just from being able to do tests on humans. Um, it's also a huge burden on our, on our um, medical infrastructure in terms of cost. So there's, there's real drivers to deal with AV fistulas. I was curious about the, the, the therapy mechanism, though. So atherosclerotic tissue is quite different from what you get in fistulas. And so is the treatment that you're delivering far enough upstream that it works in both cases? Well, we really don't know, Nathan. But um, what we're hoping, of course, is that this doesn't have to be a lifetime therapy, that if it was administered um, several times, and I'm not sure what to say several is, near the creation of the fistula that it would stabilize. Um, but um, we're really just starting to think, but seriously, about therapeutic applications. So, I mean, I, it would be good for me to talk with you a little bit more about what would make sense. Sure. But um, we, we've uh, learned the same kind of things, that this is a, a serious medical problem, and. Uh, not only, you know, on the 
let's say, the health care and health insurance industry, but on, mostly on the people themselves that have to get these multiple surgeries. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so most probably we, ha we have a sort of an idea, but I'm very curious about what do you think about the core service in the ionic water are more stable compared to supernatant because of the ionic interactions on the surface. What will happen if you introduce salt slowly to that environment? Do you think they will be even more stable because of the nice coating of ions will die on No, I didn't it? say that. Um, I, I didn't say it, but we know what happens. They, okay. they recoalesce. Yeah. They coalesce? Yeah. Huh. Thank you. <laughs> Have some questions here. Hi, have you made some toxicity test for the nanosystem components before to use in vivo? Have we made what? I'm sorry. Um, biological test for toxicity. Biological. Yeah, if uh, the polymers are toxic for uh, healthy cells. So, so, so I mean, safety uh, kinds of considerations. Is that? Yeah. We have. Um, we we uh, haven't, um, you know, done this professionally in a way that would be required by, uh, you know, the FDA or some other regulatory agency. But we haven't. We've we've thoroughly looked at these things um, and haven't observed any obvious toxicity in mice. That's all I can say. And the, and the second one, uh, have you ever think to use a target molecules for deliver the system? In the, in the specific organ or cells that you want to make the therapy? For example, aptamers. Aptamers are molecules, DNA molecules, small DNA molecules that can um, be into specific targets and have been before using for medical purposes. Well, in, uh, uh, I didn't maybe draw everything together the way I should have, but with different block copolymers, one can um, deliver a whole different range of kinds of DNA from pretty large to pretty small. And um, it, it, does, it, it does require uh, the physical chemistry characterization that, uh, that these things are stable. But this is a pretty versatile um, platform. Uh, so I think there's, you know, if, if we learned about other opportunities, uh, we could adapt to that. Thank you. One question. There's Nick oh. behind you. Uh, so thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I like the um, approach to looking for iron correlation effects in the polyelectrolyte um, coacivates. I was wondering whether you've applied the same approach to the micelle uh, environment and whether you've used deuteration to look at the organization of the core of the MISO. Yeah, no, we haven't, Nick. Um, but um, but it, 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 it would be interesting, because it's a, a confined environment, and it's not clear that they can organize themselves in the same way. But we haven't done it. And what is the blob size compared to the MISO core size? I didn't catch those two oh, lengths. What is what compared to the MISO core the, size? The blob size, the um, blob size that oh, you see in the question. Uh, um, well, in the, in the system that we looked at, which is, which is quite different from the polylysine nucleic acid, the, the, the blob sizes, it again depends upon the overall concentration. Uh, you know, I'm fumbling because I don't really remember. Um, but uh, they're obviously smaller than the radii of gyration of the polymer. So I would guess, uh, you know, they're probably in the neighborhood of the same size as the core sizes of the micelles, you know, 10 uh, uh, nanometers plus or minus a factor of two or something like that. But I, I have to check. I honestly don't remember. These, these results on uh, the neutron scattering are quite new, and I haven't fully digested them yet. But it's an interesting problem, just look inside a core, so. Well, first, uh, thank you so much for your lecture. It was a very interesting topic. And talking about the characterization of your missiles, I have a question about uh, 
Since they are like a very complex polymer, like the PEG, uh, did you encounter like any problems uh, about the interaction with light and these polymers, like the DLS, like the dynamic light scattering, uh, to be able to uh, measure the the size of these, uh, let's say, these missiles, this nuclei, as um, these complex polymers tend to uh, redirect really light in some this kinds, uh, in some aspects. So, did you encounter like any difficulty making these characterizations or be able to measure these sizes? I, I'm I'm really sorry, but I. He was I, asking about the micellar uh, characterization. Um, you're asking about micell characterization. Yeah. And. Uh, the, by PLA, PLAS. Uh, by light scattering. scattering. The, yeah. And you, you have done that to make. Yeah, sure I mean we've characterized these by every kind of scattering, <laughs> um, uh, including. Um, uh, time-resolved X-ray scattering in the formation of the micelles. There was a slide that I skipped over there, partly accidentally because this thing made me, but partly because I thought it was a, a little bit of a, um, you know, off the subject. But these micelles, uh, you can see in, in stop-flow X-ray scattering, form reasonably regular and final-sized spherical micelles within milliseconds of being brought together under the right circumstances. So we've, I, I think we've pretty thoroughly characterized these things. Now, there, there are some nuances that I didn't talk about. Like, if you're, we, we found that um, encapsulating larger double-stranded nucleic acids um, is different from encapsulating uh, single-stranded. We generally uh, get, um, extended micelles instead of spherical micelles when we try to make a block copolymer assembly with double-stranded DNA. So there, there's, there's a lot of characterization that we've done and, and that's published, and I'd be happy to point you in, in that direction. Thank you so much. Well, we, we'll have one last question. Right next to you. <laughs> yeah, uh, very nice talk, thank you. I was wondering if there's any kind of limitation um, or what do you need to change in the formulation of the micelles depending on what you need to get inside? Like, for instance, like if it's a bigger, larger molecule instead of like smaller one, what are the limitations of constraints that you need to think about it? Well, I mean, that's why we did the kind of uh, understanding the scaling dependence of uh, my cell size on block size. Um, I think that the general practical conclusion of that is if you want to carry bigger payloads, make a bigger cationic block. So there, there are, um, I think, some design rules and principles that can be used to adapt these things to optimal performance in particular situations. Thank you for your attention. I would also like to mention that there is a symposium right now, um, today and tomorrow, in honor of Dr. Durrell. Doctors Toomey and Tu have been organizing it, and it will be, if you would like to know more about his work and his legacy, please join us. And um, please, um, let's thank Dr. Durrell again uh, for a wonderful talk, and uh, if you have any more questions, I'm sure he will be around until Wednesday um, to answer any of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you.